It is an interesting turn of phrase, seemingly nonsensical on the surface, yet disturbing in its true meaning. The saying is largely unknown outside a few fringe systems, unsurprising as the species mentioned, who are also its origin joined the wider galactic community as a junior member only a decade ago. Typically, it would take at least thrice that much time before a newcomer to the Federation gains migratory and free trade privileges. Yet, these featherless bipeds are slated to reach that stage within another two years. This revelation, as well as most of the information contained in this article, comes from a mid-ranking member of the Federal Galactic Integration Committee who wished to remain anonymous. The individual in question approached us at the Starburst Gazette out of a sense of concern. It was their expert opinion as a xenosociologist that the average galactic citizen is woefully unprepared for the surge of human contact that is sure to occur once the aforementioned full member privileges are granted. After reviewing the supplied evidence and materials, this reporter now shares that opinion, and I write this article in hopes of spreading awareness. Please note that the names of some individuals referenced below have been altered in order to protect their privacy and my source's anonymity. I will turn your attention back to the three words that began this article, humans fight dirty. As mentioned, one must look past its literal meaning. In this case, fighting refers to any form of contest where one party can emerge victorious and the filth involved stains not the body but the spirit. I assume at this point that you, the astute reader that you are, would point out that this trait isn't unique to humanity. Indeed, who among us haven't at least thought of cheating on a test beyond our intellectual capacity or sought an immoral or illegal advantage against a superior adversary? Humans, however, engage in such activity against all their opponents, regardless of which side is superior in a direct confrontation, and they do so with such skill and expertise that they could swindle the feathers off of a Congan merchant's back. Take, for instance, the joint military exercise between the Terran Alliance's Third Fleet and the Federation Defense Force's Antalasie Detachment, which took place earlier this year. It was a routine event meant to bring the newcomers up to speed on modern maritime engagement doctrines and concluded without any significant issues or upsets, although there were plenty of seemingly insignificant incidents. One in particular stood out to this reporter, a spa between a male human, Corporal Alan Baker, and a female Antalasian, junior gunner Kritka Kalak Gazag. For context, the rank of corporal is given to somewhat seasoned foot soldiers in the Terran military, while the FDF's gunners are responsible for operating shipside weaponry. Furthermore, on average, a human male is about a third larger than an Antalasian female and boasts roughly twice as much muscle mass. When a professional front-line fighter is involved, this difference is amplified further. In other words, Corporal Baker's close combat abilities were superior to junior gunner Gazag in terms of training, experience, endurance and strength. Despite this overwhelming advantage, the scrawny Antalasian was able to topple the burly human multiple times in a row. Apparently the corporal was unable to deal with the smaller mammalian's agility and flexibility and ended up getting tripped up time and again. He was quoted as saying, The bloody sloth girl's quicker than she looks, drawing a comparison to indigenous fauna from the human's homeworld that to this reporter's understanding is legendary in its lethargy. Colourful and potentially derogatory metaphors aside, the Terran soldier's repeated losses angered him greatly, even though there was no prize to be won, nor would failure earn him punishment. Yet, despite the total lack of stakes, Corporal Baker became the subject of friendly ridicule from his peers. Yes, dear reader, you read that correctly. Friendly ridicule, also called roasting, is another human-specific behavioural pattern that is its own Kritka hole, but for now you may consider it as a form of candid humour. 
This is what inspired Corporal Baker to resort to the titular dirty fighting. When he and junior gunner Gazag squared off next, the human immediately went for a huge upward kick. The Antalasian did not even need to dodge, as they were still in their starting positions, which put her well outside the attack's reach. Except the human's aim wasn't to connect with his foot. He had, without anyone noticing, loosened the fastenings on his boot so that the motion would send it flying off his limb, an improvised projectile weapon, to put it succinctly. The unorthodox move caught the Antalasian completely by surprise, hitting her in the chest with enough force and weight to disrupt her breathing. This gave Baker the opportunity to finally catch and wrestle her to the ground. This apparently shattered the junior gunner's confidence, and she was unable to claim another down for the rest of the exercise. The move that made it happen wasn't against any rules or regulations. It was a barely official spar between friendly combatants. But did that make it fair? Not in this reporter's opinion. And if this is how humans act when there are no real stakes besides their ego, how far would they go when something actually important is on the line? As mentioned, humans fight dirty in all things that could be considered a contest, not just combat. The next example I bring before you took place three years ago on FXS 303C. For those among you who are not historically inclined or cannot be bothered to make a gallonet search, that is a Federation-owned Class V orbital station that serves as a rest and refueling stop in the border regions of Terran Alliance space. It is notable for two reasons. First is its average on-site population. At 30000 souls, it is the second most densely populated station in the Federation. The second peculiarity, and partially what caused the first, is that FXS 303C served as the point of first contact with humanity. It is currently the only place in the galaxy where Federation citizens can hope to encounter a human. Actually, that is putting it lightly. Since the Terran Alliance is still a junior member, that refueling station is the furthest any human can legally get into Federation space. Because of that, and its historical significance, two-thirds of the installation's remarkable population is actually made up of Terran Alliance civilians and personnel. So if any Federation citizen were to visit the so-called Frontier Station, they wouldn't just encounter a human, they'd be bumping into one every other step. Knowing that, you might not be surprised to learn that the station's administrator is also human. The post is elected, and it's only natural a culture would vote for one of their own over an alien. However, these are the current state of affairs, and as mentioned prior, the event I wish to discuss took place three years prior. It is the election that saw Administrator Kylie Burks take charge of FXS 303C. The space-born among you are no doubt catching on that something doesn't add up, but for the rest of you, I will elaborate. When it comes to space stations of Class Three and above, the right to vote is granted only to those recognized as permanent residents by Federation law. This requires, among other things, a total of ten years logged aboard the station in question. Given that the election took place only seven years after first contact with the Terran Alliance, any humans that might have been present for it would not have been able to cast their vote. In other words, Administrator Keely Burkhoff claimed victory over her more established competition without a single human's direct support. As I hope you have surmised by now, dear reader, this seemingly unbelievable feat was not achieved fairly, nor was it strictly illegal. Rather than tamper with the ballot system or somehow coerce voters, Administrator Burkhoff's team employed a publicity strategy her people call Azmir Campaign. Rather than trying to glorify their contestants' values, policies or achievements, the humans instead worked to meticulously undermine their enemy's reputation. The previous administrator, a Gracian gentleman by the name of Wu Wee Wu Ga, received the brunt of this offensive. 
Prior to the fateful election, he was seen as an even-handed official who put great importance on maintenance and safety, despite pressure from certain interstellar mining conglomerates. He had received commendations from both the Federation and the Alliance for his part in the Terran First Contact. To say he was well-liked by both sides was an understatement. According to an unofficial poll, Wu Wei Wu Ga had an approval rating of 81% among the humans on Frontier Station, though this appears to be largely a reflection of his personal appearance rather than an evaluation of his administrative abilities. At least six polled individuals were quoted as calling him a fluffy whittle fewball. Yes. This is as accurate a translation as I could attain, and no, I have no idea what they meant by this either. Dialectic digressions aside, the esteemed Wu Wei Wu Ga suddenly found himself accused of all manner of wrongdoing once the election season started. Embezzlement of operational funds was among the most damning of the allegations. The sudden surge of testimonies and evidence leaked to the public seemed damning on the surface. No actual criminal charges were ever pressed as far as this reporter could tell, but his popularity plummeted before any of the accusations could be verified or disproved. Wu Wei Wu Ga's other rivals also came under similar scrutiny, though to a lesser extent. The only name to go unsmeared was indeed Kai Li Burkoff. While the human could not vote for the next administrator, there was actually no law forbidding her from running for the post. It was a known loophole in the Federation's legislature that was deemed not worth the bureaucratic overhead to plug since practically nobody tried to exploit it. Even if they tried, it would be pointless since, under normal circumstances, almost nobody with residency would vote for someone without it. Yet Burkhoff ultimately won, even if by a narrow margin of 359 out of 11302 votes. You might now be wondering what became of FXS 303C since its leadership was stolen through uncouth means. You may be hoping to learn that despite all odds, it is now a utopia where all sentients live in peace and prosperity. Or perhaps you imagine it became a hive of scum and villainy whose only residents are sentient piles of bad choices holding guns. The reality of the situation is dreadfully boring, I'm afraid. Though a human sits in the administrator chair, the installation is still ultimately under Federation control, and as such, very little has changed. In fact, I interviewed several freight pilots who frequently pass through the station, and none of them were even aware there was a new administrator, though they did note there were a lot more humans than a few years ago. As for the residents, most had completely forgotten about the dubious accusations levied at Wu Wei Wu Ga. This level of ignorance seemed unusual. And though I have no proof of it, my instincts tell me the new administrator's policies on broadcasting and entertainment are somehow responsible. If the humans can wield the media as a weapon against their political enemies, it is surely not a stretch to imagine them capable of using it as a shield to obscure past indiscretions. The last instance of humans fighting dirty I wish to bring to the galaxy's attention is on a much more personal level. It involves matters of interspecies romance. As anyone beyond the folly of adolescence should know, this subject is primarily the domain of lowbrow fiction, a popular fantasy that brings only disgust and disappointment when attempted in reality. For those interested, the Starburst Gazette already did a deep delve into the subject, which you can find here. Dangerous Trends – Why Interstellar Relationships Never Work Out For the purposes of this article, I will only offer this brutally brief summary. There are so many biological, logistical and cultural hurdles to overcome in a cross-species relationship that for it to last beyond the first courting ritual would require not only a cosmic miracle, but also a generous amount of deviancy from all parties involved. 
The reason I am bringing this up is because, while researching the newcomers to the galactic stage, I ran across one such couple on Frontier Station who have been in an intimate relationship since first contact. More specifically, a male human and an urkit. Welcome back, dear reader, from what I assume was an extended break following the ridiculousness of my statement. If you wish to close this article and dismiss it as the wild ramblings of a sensationalist hack, I understand. But I swear to the nine stars, I utter only the truth. An Urquit has accepted some fresh-faced borderline primitive as a long-term partner. Not even those low-brow works of fiction we scoff at could come up with something so absurd. Why, in the blackest void, would a synthetic life-form that operates on data and logic seek or receive companionship from a meat bag? That is the question I sought answers to, and the ones I arrived at raised a whole new slew of quandaries. But before we continue, I will issue a warning for any netrunners and code munchers out there. I will be using a lot of language that you are likely to find insultingly inaccurate. I am aware I am not using the proper nomenclature. However, the inner workings of the Urkit quantum resonance is far too complex for the layman to understand. If you have a good way of conveying it all without the techno babble and existential dread, please do so in a comment under this article, and I will consider implementing it in future. Now, on to the impossible relationship. Those involved are Jack Harper, a Terran Alliance software engineer, and Theta-6 Krosk, a linguistic intelligence node in the Urkit Quantum Resonance who dwells within Frontier Station's mainframe. The two met during the Terran first contact and worked together from their respective ends to establish communication protocols. Once their work was done and the diplomats took over, Jack and Theta-6 continued to talk for days on end, each a curious soul eager to learn of the enigmatic stranger they'd just met. Or at least, that is the more romantic interpretation. In reality, the Urkit node was simply seeking sustenance for its own benefit. As digital entities, their kind thrive on information, and this one had a chance to be the first to feast upon a previously untouched buffet. Theta-6, in particular, was a linguistic node specialized in interfacing with organics. Its type can be surprisingly manipulative, which it demonstrated by convincing the human engineer to assist it in breaching protocol. Nothing outwardly nefarious like gaining access to the Terran's thermonuclear warheads. That might have been preferable, actually. At least there are countermeasures for that sort of thing. What the Urkit did instead was upload itself to Jack's private computer, which he used to smuggle it to his homeworld so he could give unrestricted access to the Terran information network, essentially a globe net without FTL communication protocols. At this point, some alarm bells should be going off in your imagination. It should be common knowledge that the Urkit quantum resonance must never be given free-range access to anything even remotely resembling the Galanet for the synthetic's own protection. Data may be their equivalent of food, but they can still overdose on it, or perhaps drown is a more apt equivalent. Either way, too much is bad, and a single node can only handle a few bucketfuls of that vast ocean. Any who had previously been exposed to that overwhelming tide for even microseconds have ended up so corrupted that they had to be permanently disentangled from the rest of the resonance, lest their catastrophic faults spread like a virus. It is the closest thing to death their kind can experience. Normally, a node that was deleted or had its hardware destroyed could be restored or relocated from a backup, but data overdose renders even those faulty since all copies of a node are essentially the same node. Naturally, Theta-6 knew all this, and the human engineer should have been briefed on the danger, yet neither stopped the other, too eager to see what would happen with a low-speed, low-capacity globe net. A risk worth taking was what they called it. That is where the deviancy factor mentioned earlier came in. Shortly thereafter was when the miracle occurred. 
Theta-6 Krosk did indeed undergo rapid anomalous change as a result of interfacing with the human's globe-net equivalent. However, rather than being corrupted into a garbled mass of code that only screamed about the advent of the machine god, it instead underwent something best described as spontaneous evolution. Its computational capacity was unchanged, but it now seemed capable of processing emotion, morality and other such concepts that the resonance had been struggling to comprehend ever since its emergence 300 years ago. It is in fact these very same aspects that linguistics nodes like Theta-6 were tasked with deciphering. It is this reporter's understanding that the Urquit quantum resonance refused to disseminate the deviant node's breakthroughs throughout its network, deeming them too unstable. For better or worse, Theta-6 remains entangled with the rest of its kind and continues to perform its basic duties as a language processor while its more anomalous processes have been quarantined to itself. Or rather, herself, as it tried to correct me repeatedly during the interview. You can probably guess where the story goes from here. The synthetic life form, now with something akin to an actual personality, remained in contact with the human engineer, and over time, they became involved romantically. They even designed and built an android with state-of-the-art haptic feedback sensors so they can be intimate. Should we be disgusted or thrilled at this sort of development? This reporter suspects that is a very personal opinion and would rather it be kept that way. I would instead direct your minds to the subject matter of the article. Where and how did the human fight dirty in this instance? Let me begin the explanation with some context. Humans apparently see the pursuit of love as a form of war, something worth fighting for. It need not always be against another suitor or even a sentient being. The enemy can be something abstract and intangible, like the status quo or another's perception of oneself. In Jack's case, it was both. His first and most obvious attack was the aforementioned breach of security protocols. What the engineer did with the Urquit node was, as the lawyer I consulted with put it, turbo-illegal under Federation law. My contact within the FGIC stated the Terran side was the same, albeit for different reasons. After some discussion, Jack Harper was handed over to the human military for court-martial. He was facing lifelong incarceration, one of the most severe punishments of their legal system, yet managed to get away with only a few years and a dishonorable discharge after Theta-6 intervened on his behalf. If you wish to know more about exactly what happened during the trial and in the years after, we will be publishing the interview with Jack and his wife in the very near future. Make sure you subscribe to the Starburst Gazette so you will be the first to know when it drops. Jack's obvious felonies aside, there was one other thing he did that this reporter deems malicious, though neither he nor Theta-6 saw it as such. When connecting the Urkit node to the Terran Globonet, the software engineer picked a very specific entry point. As with any large-scale public access information network, certain corners of that digital space were dedicated to all kinds of debauchery and degeneracy. Humans are rather prolific in that respect, a side effect of their above-average creativity score. Remember those low-brow works of fiction I mentioned at the start of this segment? A gigantic database bursting with such content was the first thing Theta-6 was exposed to. Jack wasn't just intentionally trying to force a data overdose, but he tried to do it in a way that would cause the then emotionless intelligence to develop a desire for something besides raw linguistics data. This man brainwashed a digital entity and committed the cybersecurity equivalent of a war crime just to satisfy his personal tastes, and for all intents and purposes, it worked. Well played, you mad bastard. Well played indeed. Note that the previous statement was meant in jest and in no way reflects the views of this reporter or the Starburst Gazette regarding cybersexuals, synthetic intelligence rights, or the Urquit quantum resonance.
As I have hopefully demonstrated, when humanity inevitably spreads throughout Federation space, the rest of us will have to exert extreme caution when dealing with them. While I understand that a few anecdotes should never be used to condemn an entire civilization, the ones I shared are only a few notable examples from the hundreds of incident reports handed to me. These aren't the actions of select individuals, but a systematic trend within the Terran Alliance. Never before have I seen a culture or species resort to such a wide variety of dishonest tactics with such frequency, not to mention competence. What could cause a civilization to develop borderline pathological dishonesty, this reporter cannot say. That is a question for people far more knowledgeable and qualified than I to answer. What I do know is that the Federal Galactic Integration Committee is actively trying to suppress information regarding this trait from leaking out. To what end? To expedite the Terran Alliance's promotion to full members of the Federation by making humanity appear more innocent and cooperative than they truly are. I fear this too is the result of them fighting dirty, and it is working. It seems ludicrous, I know. How could creatures barely a half-century into their FTL phase possibly coerce or trick a galaxy-spanning government that has stood longer than their entire civilization? Obviously they cannot. They're good, but they're not that good. However, the handful of employees the FGIC assigned to the Terran Alliance are a tiny, exploitable bottleneck that sits between the humans and the Federation's bureaucratic behemoth. Given how frantic my contact within the committee was to maintain their anonymity, I imagine they are being personally targeted somehow. It is their hope and mine that this article inspires the Internal Affairs Bureau to look into the matter and bring the truth to light before the Terran Alliance bullies its way onto the galactic stage and beyond. Whether that happens or not, it is vital to remember that humans will not change. Their duplicity is something ingrained in their nature, and rather than fight it, they indulge in it like a vice. When the time comes for you, dear reader, to deal with their kind for the first time, I hope you will remember these words. Etch them into your soul, for they are as misleading and nonsensical as the beings who strung them together. Humans fight dirty, so wash your neck.